The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our special one-hour webinar, Moving to the Modern Workplace, an end-to-end -end Office 365 migration story. Just a little bit about Protivity before we get started. Protivity provides consulting solutions in finance, technology, operations, data, analytics, governance, risk, and internal audit to our clients through our network of more than 70 offices in over 20 countries. Our full service software solutions team provides consulting and on-demand support for SharePoint, Office 365, Salesforce, Nintex, Sitecore, Kentico, SQL, and .NET. Our next webinar is scheduled for June 14th, and that's back to the traditional 30-minute presentation. And you can register for that and get a full look at all of our events at ecm.protivity.com slash events. Today's session is being recorded, and you can access the recording and see all past webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. Along with that, this deck will be sent out to everyone on the call early next week, so please keep your eyes out for that. And if you do have any questions today during this webinar, please insert them in the question window on the GoToMeeting toolbar, and we will take five to 10 minutes at the end to answer all questions. Thanks in advance. Today's presenters are Antonio Mayo, Protivity's um, Associate Director, and we have a wonderful guest speaker, owner of Next Novus, Joanne Klein. And my name is Taylor Ganser, and I will be moderating today's session. With that, I'll pass the torch over to you, Antonio. Thanks, Taylor. Can you just confirm for me that you're able to see my screen? Yes, all good. Great. I'm good, Antonio. Great. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. My name is Antonio Mayo, and welcome to our webinar on an end-to-end -end migration story. Um, I have with me a very good friend, Joanne Klein. Hey, Joanne. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here today. Um, now, Joanne and I have seen the workplace undergo some major shifts in the last few years with widespread adoption of cloud services, mobile computing, and a lot more people working remotely. Often, this shift involves migrating your existing services or applications or large repositories of content to cloud platforms like Office 365. And we find that a migration to Office 365 brings with it a lot of benefits to both end users and to the organization. But to successfully migrate to the cloud really needs some careful planning, um, a lot of preparation, considering considerations for things like security, compliance, and training, and some expertise with the platform itself. So Joanne and I decided to get together and share some of our experiences with you. Yeah, Antonio and I both come from different uh, customer backgrounds, but we both have discovered the same issues we're seeing over and over again. So hopefully people will have some key takeaways from today. Absolutely. So we're going to start off by introducing our migration scenario. We're going to talk about some of the considerations that um, you should think about before you migrate. We're going to talk about what um, developing a site structure and information architecture before you migrate looks like. Then we're going to talk about the actual steps you take to migrate your data to Office 365 and, and specifically to SharePoint Online. Uh, we're going to talk about applying security controls. And then finally, some post-migration steps that are important to really make your migration successful. All right. For those of you that know me, I like the Twitters. And so I put out a poll about five months ago now, I'd say, on what people thought the biggest roadblock for their organizations was in moving their shared network drives into SharePoint. And as you can see by this result, an overwhelming majority just feel this was a really messy, time consuming job. And it is, in fact. And a, a lot of the uh, feedback, in addition, I got to this was the shared network drive um, paradigm is basically embedded in corporate culture today. It's, it's a really hard paradigm to move away from. Um, as well, lots of people aren't maybe focusing on the SharePoint end of it. What, what can SharePoint bring to uh, organizations that shared network drives just can't deliver on? And the third is um, painting this as much more than just a technical lift and shift move into SharePoint. There has to be more, a uh, better value proposition than just that. It's more than just a technical move. 
So to demonstrate this, uh, Antonio and I thought, let's look at a fictitious company undertaking their own company-wide initiative to migrate away from network drives. So first, you will need to define your objectives for the project. Uh, you want to move away from that into a better, more collaborative space. You likely want to enable mobile access. Uh, you want to try to prevent document duplication, which is a big problem in the shared network drive world today. Uh, we want to you know, form new habits, quit attaching documents to emails, for instance. Uh, maybe we want to increase the findability of the content and create a better space for people to uh, be able to share and work with their content, avoiding that shadow IT. Your staff are likely already using some of those solutions. And what is your scope and approach? What I commonly see is approaching this from a organizational unit perspective, i.e. division by division within their departments and teams even from that. Um, and migrating, if, you, if you're tackling the user file shares, getting them into OneDrive for Business, those team file shares, moving them into SharePoint Online. So this is a, a very common scope and approach you'd see in an organization. And we see uh, much of the same things um, when we're um, helping organizations move into Office 365. Some of the, uh, just to point out, some of the, the, the really high runners here, the objectives that a lot of organizations try to achieve is enabling mobile access. Right, the fact that SharePoint pages are by their nature responsive and look beautiful and work well on smartphones and tablets as well as your laptops and desktops um, is a big driver. Avoiding document duplication, as you mentioned, and making content more findable. Yeah, one important thing to remember before you start, there's a key thing I, I think lays the groundwork for a successful migration, and that would be getting leadership buy-in and support. And this is a real thing and makes a, a absolute positive difference if you can in fact get this. And I, I think there's four things I wanna point out first. You need to explain to the executive team what this move um, has, what's the value proposition for the organization. Very important to do that. And this helps get the attention the migration team you have set up needs when they go out to those teams and they wanna take up a lot of their time to clean up their content and, and work with them to set up their SharePoint environment. This likely won't be the team's priority, um, which goes back to the Twitter poll. That This is not a priority for most teams. They've got other business as usual project work they're working on. So if leadership is kind of giving the direction, yes, we wanna do this, we wanna get off the shared network drive space, that will make the migration team's effort go a lot smoother. And two expectations. This won't happen overnight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. And when all is said and done, there's a very good chance that shared drives will still exist in some form or fashion for some content. So make sure the leadership team understands that because sometimes uh, they, they may not um, have that picture. And Joanne, I think I would add a third expectation here that. Um we see with many organizations and that's um, this is usually not the type of activity that someone can do on the side while also doing their regular full-time job. Often when undertaking a company-wide migration or even a migration of business units or departments or teams, it requires you know a, a person at minimum to organize and plan and run the project, if not a, a team of people that have to collaboratively work together to make this successful. And have you Absolutely. seen the same thing? I have, definitely. Um, the migration team that I'm currently on, there's representation from the information management team, um, the adoption team, as well as the technical team doing the migration. So it, it's a, a joint effort that requires you know, m many hats that you need to wear in order to make this happen. In addition to the teams, they need to you know, put forth some people to work on it from, from their side. Uh, and dedicate to this effort. So it's it's yeah. a number of people that need to work together. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's there's one thing I love there that you mentioned that they have an adoption team. You don't often hear that. Yeah, that's that's really critical to make this work once you get into SharePoint, in my opinion. Now, in the case of our example here, um, we're going to focus on a marketing team to start. So we're going to start off by um, helping the marketing team or understanding what the marketing team's requirements are. Um, they likely have a lot of old content. Um, some of that content may no longer be relevant. If they're using network file shares heavily, they 
likely have nested folders. Um, especially for a marketing team, the old adage that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words is very true. Marketing teams often have a lot of videos and a lot of pictures, and sometimes that implies really large files that often have to be dealt with in specific ways. Going back to Joanne's point that, um, you know, file shares, network repositories might not go away 100%. And you might find that not everyone in the marketing team really sees this as a good move. They might actually think that the current way of working is fine. So you have to think about how can we position the migration effort um, as having a positive impact, business impact for the team, right? Because they will be impacted one way or another. What I find myself um, explaining numerous times is answering the current way is working just fine argument. And, and my best uh, defense on that is point out the benefits and the drawbacks. So we're gonna go through a few of them here. Of course, mobility, anytime, anywhere, any device uh, is, is a huge benefit of being in SharePoint. Uh, the drawback on the shared network drives, you have to be connected to the cor corporate network. Co-authoring, uh, once end users understand what that means and how uh, multiple pe people can be in the same document, that is a, a real eye-opener for them. Version history, there's another one where instead of having duplicate copies of documents with the version name perhaps built into the document name, leverage version history. It's, it's one of the key things that an adoption person needs to uh, demonstrate to users once they're into SharePoint. Metadata and views provide far more flexibility than folder structure and file names ever could. Um, for those of you that are familiar with SharePoint and have been there for a while, you, you know this to be true. I am not in the camp that says no folders. I, I think a, a judicious use of folders and metadata is uh, kind of the sweet spot. Of course, there's exceptions on either side of the rule, but uh, that's my, my starting position. And this is a golden opportunity to rethink some of those business processes that are happening even in the shared network drive space. This, this is what you need to, when you have a business analyst reaching out to the team you're about to migrate, ask some questions about, um, it's not just the documents, it's what does the business do with these documents and identify some of those processes that maybe you can streamline once you're into SharePoint. So we wanna look for those productivity wins along the way. And we've got some examples of some. There's many, many examples of this, but some really good ones. Uh, my friend Tracy Vanderskyf um, has blogged about creating new customer contacts at events, something that a marketing team um, would typically do. And it's all based on a QR code generated from a Microsoft form. It's an example of how you can leverage that, populate the entries in a SharePoint list, you could put a task on a planner board. Um, you could uh, start a conversation in a team um, channel. You can do many things with that as well. You could update pictures automatically to from an event that the marketing team was on to their uh, SharePoint team site or their OneDrive site. Much better than putting them on a shared network drive space somewhere. All right, third example is you can create workflows that will automatically describe photos or products, actually automatically create a descriptive sentence of the contents of your photo, automatically create tags that describe the photos, making them more easily searchable. If you think about a marketing team collecting photos over um, a number of years, um, you can have them automatically create thumbnail renditions of those photos as well. So those are all use cases that are, are fairly um, resonant with a marketing team that would help them be more productive. You can also have contacts, customer contacts, perhaps um, captured from the first example that Joanne mentioned, automatically added as leads from an event to um, Dynamics 365 to um, Dynamics CRM. And then from that, you can automatically follow up with an email to keep that lead warm. So there's a number of opportunities like this um, to help you know, take advantage of this golden opportunity to rethink business processes and you know, use these ways that the team can become more productive through business process automation as um, you know, real drivers for them moving to Office 365. This is the big value add of moving to SharePoint. This is the value proposition that your leadership team is interested in uh, more than just a different place to store your files. So this is really important that we don't forget about this part. And, and oftentimes 
why this process ends up taking a little bit longer than initially thought. One of the reasons. And, you know, an important point, and I think we're stealing this point from Mark Anderson, who's a friend of both of ours and we both respect heavily. You can't sell the migration product, project as only a technical win. Often a migration project will start with an IT team or with a migration team who's very technically focused. But really, this has to be a win for the business. Um, now, that said, there are advantages for the technical team as well. So it's important not to ignore those, right? If you think about things like um, if you've been through multiple SharePoint migrations before, once you migrate to SharePoint Online, theoretically, you are never doing another SharePoint migration again, right? That alone can be big value for the technical team. Um, the fact that you're no longer applying SharePoint server updates or security updates or cumulative updates to your SharePoint server farm, right? That's all handled for you in Office 365. So there are some real technical benefits for the technical team, but to reiterate the point here, you can't sell the migration project as only a technical win. You do have to highlight the, the business wins and the business and productivity gains that you're gonna get from it as well. Absolutely. Now, I say this a lot, and I firmly believe to this day, you cannot approach a migration project as a pure lift and shift. And there's two main myths that go along with this. The first one is uh, the mistaken idea that you'll clean the content up after you migrate. It, it will be no easier, and in some cases, maybe more difficult to do it after the fact. So I I would say uh, clean it up before you bring it across. And the second myth is SharePoint search is good. It'll find what we need in this mess if, in fact, you don't clean it up before you bring it over. And although SharePoint is search is good, you don't want to bring in duplicate copies, trivial, trivial content. Um, the end user experience will not be good. How to do that? Clean up what we call the rot. First off, redundant data. By this, I mean duplicate content that's out there and and I've, I see it time and time again. Uh, it goes back to the version one, version two, version final, final, final versions of documents that are out there on shared network drives. Um, clean those up if you possibly can and bring them across and start version history from the moment it's into SharePoint. The second one is obsolete. Perhaps your company can you know globally decide we're not going to bring over anything X years um, old or older, what, whatever that number is, three, five, 10 years, whatever you can live with, uh, depends how long your shared network drives have been out there. Uh, that's, a, that's a great approach to, to give the bit end users um, kind of the, the thumbs up that they're okay deleting that old content. Lots of times end users are scared to delete content. They want somebody maybe from their risk team to tell them it's okay to do that. And the third one is trivial content. By this, I mean working copies of documents that might be out there, um, I don't know, per personal um, files that may be sitting there that you don't want be to be brought into SharePoint, those types of things. Uh, we don't wanna bring those into SharePoint. We Let's just get rid of them. So an idea to help with this cleanup is get creative. I've seen um, organizations have a most deleted content contest, percentage wise, of what they started with, with their shared network folders and what they end up with. Um, I've seen teams lock themselves in a meeting room for half a day or a day and decide, you know, we're going to go through lo lots of things need to be discussed on if you need to keep them or uh, how you want to organize them. Um, so a dedicated cleanup day for that and just um, soldier through it. And you can also leverage tools to help automatically identify duplicates and then automatically delete them for you. Um, those are, you know, paid tools over and above what you're going to get manually. So it depends on the size of the organization and the amount of content that you're working with. But it's really important to do this job. And this is what takes a long, long time. I love the idea of a content cleanup day. I think you could gain a lot of benefit just from holding one of those. Yeah, successful. Um, now, once you've decided not to do a lift and shift, and I wholeheartedly agree with the recommendation there, um, and you've defined a strategy for cleaning up the rot. Um, there are some hard rules that you need to consider. Um, there are some pre-migration checking you want to do. You want to look at things like 
the number of files and individual folders and file shares because that will affect where they migrate into Office 365. You want to consider duplicate files and also unsupported characters. There are still a couple of characters in file names that are not supported in Office 365 and you have to understand and decide how you're gonna deal with those. You wanna understand the URL length if in particular you have a deep folder structure within your network file shares and, and we see this time and again. Um, when you take all of those folders into account and if you plan to keep that deep file share, that sorry, that deep folder structure, it's going to end up in some really long URLs in Office 365. And there is a limit of 400 characters for your URLs in SharePoint Online in Office 365. So that's important to understand. And then the file size limits, of course. Um, SharePoint Online is designed to um, contain files up to 15 gigabytes in size. But if you have larger files than that, for, for example, large CAD files or blueprints, perhaps large PowerPoint presentations that have embedded video, those can sometimes get over 15 gigs in size. Well, then those might not belong in um, SharePoint Online. That's one case where you might still require network file share. All right. There's also soft rules, or what I call soft rules. First is the nature of files. And what I mean by that is if your organization has a rule, for example, that no customer information, customer document information should exist in your SharePoint environment, maybe you've got a third party um, product where all of that content needs to reside. Um, you have to know that and not bring that into SharePoint. So that's very organization specific. The second one is the just because you can doesn't mean you should rule. And what do I mean by that is uh, particularly when you are working with maybe the IT team and migrating their shared network drive content in, you're going to run across all kinds of things like backups, source code, executables, installation binaries, all of those things that have been sitting on the shared network drive space. And although you can migrate them into SharePoint, there likely is more appropriate repositories for that type of content that I feel that content is better suited living in. So just keep those in mind uh, as you're reviewing the type of content that each team has. Now we've got two more important considerations for before you migrate. One is to understand the performance of your migration and the throttling that um, you could experience. So data migrations into Office 365 can be throttled by Microsoft. And that's even when you're using the migration API that a number of the third party tools that there support or that you can invoke yourself. Um, the throttling is there to protect the Office 365 service and to ensure that um, just because you, know, you or other organizations are migrating lots of data into it, that the user experience for others is not adversely affected or, or vice versa so that your user experience is not adversely affected if someone else is migrating lots of data in. So there are um, factors and considerations to take into account, uh, both in terms of the type of content and how it might be throttled, how um, that content, you know, depending on its complexity or the amount of metadata that, that is applied, how it could be throttled. As well, uh, it's important to consider how you're actually doing the migration. There's various tactics that you can use to avoid getting throttled, and, and those get very technical very quick. One uh, important factor there is if you're going to use PowerShell to do your migration, um, how you decorate your HTTP traffic, um, and this is not just related to PowerShell, but how you decorate your HTTP traffic will affect whether it's throttled or not, or, or stopped altogether. Now, Microsoft has published some statistics, which I've, I've uh, listed here, around some of the average customer experiences um, you know, they show here that you can get somewhere between two terabytes a day migrating to SharePoint Online down to 250 gigabytes a day. Um, I'll be honest, we usually don't see these kinds of numbers. Um, the speed that we see uh, on average migrating content to SharePoint Online is much lower than this. You know, we at a maximum tend to see somewhere between 300 to 400 gigabytes a week migrate into SharePoint Online. Um, and it can be throttled right down depending on what's happening in the data center you're migrating in. We've seen speeds as low as 15 gigabytes a day. So these are important factors to take into account. And uh, they are affected by a few other things like the number of concurrent migrations you're running, obviously your internet bandwidth into Azure, 
um, and the configuration of your migration computer or what's sometimes called your migration rig. And then finally, another consideration before you're migrating is the storage limits in Office 365. Now, um, storage across SharePoint Online sites is pooled. So when you create an Office 365 tenant, you get a pool of storage, which is shared across all your site collections. Um, OneDrive for Business has specific storage limits for each OneDrive for Business site collection, because those are personal site collections. Now with SharePoint Online, um, the, uh, traditionally, the storage limits have been, uh, you know, a tenant is allocated one terabyte of space plus half a gigabyte per user license that you've purchased. And again, that space is shared across all your SharePoint site collections. So a 500 person organization can expect to have one and a quarter terabytes of storage space. And of course they have the option to purchase more. But then only, you know, a mere 20 days ago, Microsoft announced that they're increasing that per user storage limit. So now with an Office 365 tenant, you'll get one terabyte of space plus 10 gigabytes per user license that you purchase. And again, that's shared across all your SharePoint online site collections. So now instead of one and a quarter terabytes of space, a 500 person organization can expect to have six terabytes of storage space. And of course, with the option to purchase more. And that's, that's a 20 times increase in the per user portion of storage for your site collections, right? And that was just added to the service 20 days ago without increasing prices, without um, customers having to do anything more. So that was a, a great new advantage that was added to um, SharePoint Online specifically. Before you migrate into SharePoint, you need to have a structure to migrate it into. So let's talk SharePoint site architecture. Lots of planning goes into this. Your first decision is what asset are you going to create, a site collection or a subsite? So a site collection, just so we're all on the same uh, playing field, is a top level site container, contains one root site, can contain many subsites. And an important distinction about a site collection is many things are scoped at this level. In fact, all of these things you see on the bottom are scoped at a site collection level, which uh, makes a site collection a very flexible um, option. Subsites, on the other hand, uh, many of them can exist within one site collection, and a subsite can itself be a subsite. Few things are scoped at this level. So my recommendation is to provision a site collection when and wherever possible. What site collections are is a flat site architecture. And some would say that is in vogue right now. And what that does is buys long-term flexibility. Each site collection is, can be treated as a discrete unit of work with its own permissions, its own features, its own branding, its own navigation. Um, and really allow you to do that plug and play uh, uh, with each site collection. SharePoint Hubs is in place to um, organize your site collections into a virtual hierarchy for you. There, of course, is, is a limit. It's a high limit, but in some large organizations, you definitely need to be aware of this, of 500,000. Subsites are, sorry, Subsites are what I call a deep site architecture. Here's an example of three site collections. So you have far fewer site collections, many subsites within. An important thing to know about this is it's generally less flexible, really relies on that inheritance model. So if you change one subsite, everything underneath of it will um, by default inherit from that subsite. And you might say that's a good thing, and sometimes it is, but um, sometimes you don't want to inherit from the parent ab above you, which is why um, a flat site architecture buys you a little bit more flexibility than the deep site architecture does. After you decide what kind of site you want to provision, laid on top of that is the information architecture. And this diagram shows the different types of sites that you can provision in um, SharePoint. The further you go up this triangle, up to number one, generally speaking, the more structure and governance you want defined. So everything above that top red line, you would typically have quite a bit of um, structure, quite a bit of information architecture, typically fewer 
content authors and contributors, and a wide viewing audience. In Zones 3 and 4, this is where Office 365 group sites are provisioned. That could be a Microsoft Teams, a modern team site, a group of Yammer group. In there, it requires a deft touch to know what is the right amount of information architecture that is appropriate for um, the teams that you are um, creating in there. It, it really requires, in my opinion, an, an experienced eye to, to not put too much, but to put just enough that it um, works effectively for the team. And down at the bottom would be your personal OneDrive for business sites, where typically the only type of information architecture that's per, that's used are the, your foldering system in your uh, library. Um, and it really only needs to make sense to the individual that has and owns the OneDrive for business site. What this does for you, if you have a well thought out SharePoint site and information architecture, it really supports laying that business process automation on top of it. Tools like Power BI, Power Apps, Microsoft Flow are examples of what you can do. And unless you've really thought out your SharePoint environment and the information architecture, um, it will be more difficult to, to use those tools. So that's the value proposition of having a well thought out architecture in your sites. Yeah, those I completely agree. Those tools provide a lot of value in terms of um, providing insights and dashboards, you know, apps or forms and, and automating business process, but they rely heavily on a well-defined information architecture, knowing where to find content or where to place content or how content is described or metadata fields that define, you know, what, what attributes are required for a workflow or for an app or to be surfaced as part of a Power BI dashboard. So those two things very much go hand in hand, the, the business process automation with a good well thought out information architecture. Okay, so by this time, you've already done a ton of work, right? You've already, you know, I won't go through all of this, but you've already defined things like your migration objectives and your approach, you've got leadership buy-in, you've done your pre-migration checks and figured out how to clean up the rot, you've defined um, that well thought out site architecture um, and information architecture, you defined those, um, uh, those productivity wins that you're gonna target, you understand some of the technical aspects like migration throttling and storage limits, and you defined a well thought out migration project plan, which actually defines when each business unit or department or team or which parts of content will be moving when. So at this point, it's time to select a migration tool or to select uh, an approach for how you're gonna do that migration. Because in some cases, if it's very small, you could actually do a manual migration and migrate that content in. You do lose things like um, you know, metadata related to um, last modified dates and times and people and so on, but it is possible. You could choose to use PowerShell to actually do the migration. That can work very well, again, depending on your structure and the amount of content that you have and how customized you have to make it. There are some great third-party tools out there that many of us have experience with that give you a lot of advantage, as Joanne mentioned, to cleaning up the rot early on, transferring metadata in and moving your content in efficiently. And then finally, there's the relatively new SharePoint migration tool that we want to talk a little bit about. Um, now, the SharePoint migration tool, it's a great, um, simple, easy to use and free tool that's available from Microsoft. It was really just released, I think, in January of this year, and now version two just came out in April. It can migrate content from either on-prem SharePoint 2013 lists and libraries or your on-premise file shares. Um, now, the lists feature, that was actually just introduced to version two, so it's a great new addition. And in terms of destination, it can migrate your content into SharePoint Online or OneDrive for Business within Office 365. And some of the companion tools that Microsoft has released in the past as well that, that you would use along with it are things like the Migration Assessment Tool, which is a command line tool, again, really easy to use, but helps you identify what the impact of migrating to SharePoint Online is gonna be. And then there's a SharePoint Migration Identity Management Tool that helps you map identities um, between your on-premise SharePoint and AD into Azure AD um, online. Now you're ready to migrate, right? You've 
provision that site structure and libraries and information architecture that you've defined. You build your migration rig. This is step two. Now migration rig, this is really setting up your migration computer and setting up the um, application or PowerShell scripts or what have you that you're going to use to actually do the migration. Um, you wanna perform some test migrations in part to validate your migration rig to make sure the application is working correctly, it has all the right permissions, but then also to test the speed, to understand if there are some, you know, perhaps related to your location or your network bandwidth for your organization, if you do have some limitations there. You're then gonna start migrating your data to your production environment. Now you're gonna monitor the performance of this, right? And you wanna to work towards that well-defined schedule. Things like problem sites or complex sites and content. So if you run across a site that for whatever reason is not migrating incorrectly, you tend to wanna to deal with those separately, right? You wanna make sure you stay on plan, that you stay on schedule. So we often recommend that when you run into a problem site or a problem set of content, that you put it aside and you deal with it afterwards and you continue on to plan. Um, for large migrations in particular, your migration team is often gonna be more than one person. Right, perhaps you have one person that is running the migration according to plan, and you have a second person that's dealing with those problem sites or, or content, and perhaps you have others that are testing um, and making adjustments based on feedback from your business users. And a migration team I'm working on now, that's in fact how we've done it. Um, and we have a really big planner board that has the progress of the migration going through many stages and at different points of the migration for any particular team there's a different member of the team working with them so at, at the beginning it might be the information management team then it moves into the business analyst um, that is looking at their business processes eventually it gets onto the technical migration team and then the uh, customer review and the feedback and the adoption and training. So lots of people have a part to play in this migration. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. A collaborative effort like that really helps to make it successful. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth step here is reporting on progress. Now you wanna be prepared to report on progress um, on a regular basis, right? So with a regular frequency, whether it's daily reports or weekly reports, what have you, but your leadership team that, that um, you know, signed off on moving ahead with this effort is going to want to have some regular reports on what the progress is like. And you want to plan ahead for this. You want to make it really easy for you to pull reports. Yeah, to, another idea that we've uh, implemented on our team that's pretty easy to do and, and been quite effective is a SharePoint list that has all of the teams uh, by department and division that we've migrated and what stage they're at. Um, and then we Build a built a Power BI dashboard off of that and shared that with the leadership team so they can see at any point in time where we're at organization wide on the migration. Really, a, uh, an effective way of communicating yep. that progress. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, you want to plan for testing of the migrated content, so you want to have some sort of user acceptance testing planned out, perhaps a a test plan. Um, that's documented and you want to involve the business in that to ensure that you know the the migrated content where it's ending up is actually meeting the business need and you should expect to re-migrate some portion of your content often you find with business units or teams when they actually get in and look at the content that you've migrated right within sharepoint online and they start playing with it they might come back with feedback saying you know well we we actually we think we'd like to split this library up into multiple libraries or folders or split this site or combine these libraries uh, because it would just work better for this particular process. So you can expect some small percentage of that. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great thing to do. Um, it's where sometimes people don't know what it's going to be like, particularly if they're new to SharePoint. Once they get in there and use it, then sometimes a light bulb goes on and they, and they wanna adjust it a little bit. So you have to build that into your timetable. Yeah, and then finally, um, you should plan to place your source environment in a read-only state. Now, you very much want to encourage people to use the new environment that you've migrated content to. Um, you often want to keep the source environment there so that people can go back and just validate that all their content got moved correctly, or if they, you know, they can't find something that's really business critical, maybe they'll fall back to the 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 network file share to find it in that instance. You you don't you don't um, you don't want to encourage that necessarily, but 
people do sometimes end up in business critical situations where they just they need to find a particular document. Um, so there's that. But you do want to plan for putting it in a read-only state for a period of time, and then eventually decommissioning that um, legacy system, the source environment. Um, decommissioning might be six months down the road, a year down the road, or two years down the road. But you do want to plan out what that time frame is and give your users plenty of warning. Definitely. That's the important part. We eventually want to get rid of that content on the shared network drive. So That's right. uh, someone has to be uh, tasked with that, with that job. Yep. And what we haven't mentioned through this really is the communication plan. So, you know, along with this, usually you have a communication plan, which is informing users when they're about to migrate in advance. You know, you might send uh, an email two weeks before the migration saying, hey, quick reminder, you're going to be migrating on this date, uh, maybe a week before, two days before, a day before, the day of, um, just so that people are in the know around when their content is moving and can plan around that. And as part of your planning, you often take into account also busy times of the year, right? For example, you usually don't migrate an accounting team or a finance team around tax season. So sometimes there are these business critical events that you have to work around and take into account. All right, now that we're in SharePoint, one of the big benefits is the ability to apply um, lots of controls on the content. Now, what we're about to cover is not a, an exhaustive list of all of the controls that are available, to be clear, but uh, we'll cover four of them that are um, pretty important as it relates to SharePoint content. The first being Azure Information Protection, which is a way of um, classifying your documents and stores a, a sensitivity property at the document level. And it lives with that document um, from the time it is created until the time it is disposed of. And with that label, you can enforce protection and usage rights. So maybe you don't wanna have a document edited or copied or um, forwarded to anybody. You can do that with an Azure Inf Information Protection label. Lots of planning needs to go into what your organization's classification scheme is because every end user is going to see these labels in all of their Office client products, um, as well as in File Explorer when they, um, if they have a document on their, uh, in their, on their on-premises, um, uh, sorry, on their hard drive or even on SharePoint on-premises uh, environments, you can also deploy your AIP labels. So lots of planning needs to go into that, defining what those are for your organization. Um, so end users understand when is the right time to apply a particular label to a particular type of document based on its sensitivity. Another important control that we often see clients interested in or, or um, put in place is data loss prevention or DLP. Um, we usually recommend that you put this in place post migration, so not during the migration, because data loss prevention is going to look at your content to identify sensitive information, right? And here by sensitive information, we mean things like um, regular expressions. So patterns and numbers that identify things like a social security number or a driver's license number, a credit card number, passport number, et cetera. Um, keywords fall into that category as well. Um, the Office 365 DLP system has 82 built-in sensitive data types, which you can take advantage of, or you can create your own custom sensitive data types as well. And we usually recommend you put in place data pr loss prevention policies um, after a migration because as your content is moving in, as those identifiers are found, policies will often raise alerts. And as the content is moving in, you may not want those alerts creating noise while you're trying to deal with the migration actually coming in. But once your migration is done, this is a great tool to apply to identify sensitive content, to raise alerts and notifications to your information security team, but also to enforce policies on those documents. Right. If if uh, regular end users are not permitted to access content that contains credit card numbers, you can have access to those documents um, automatically prevented in those cases, except for you know select user groups or users. A third um, security control, very obviously, is permissions. So here we're talking about SharePoint permissions, and these can be applied with either you know SharePoint or Active Directory groups. 
They can be provide, they can be applied um, using individual users as well. Um, you know, typically we would recommend you apply permissions using groups, uh, SharePoint groups, Active Directory groups, but in the case of Office 365 groups, they are actually applied using individuals. Um, and then, you know, to control permissions, this is one of the classic, I'll say, governance issues or challenges that organizations find is the control of permissions. To control that really requires good, strong information governance policies. Things like defining data ownership, defining the responsibilities of data owners, creating an access request process, so when someone needs to request access to a particular piece of content, and having regular permission reviews and recertification. These are all important things that go along with managing permissions in a well-controlled way. Big benefit of being in SharePoint, of course, is applying retention controls on the content that's in there, keeping content for as long as you should and disposing of it as soon as you should. And that's done through retention labels and policies. Uh, lots of different retention scenarios are likely identified in your um, organization's file plan. Your information management team will be um, uh, aware of what those are. So you can have time-based retention, event-based retention, a bunch of different scenarios you're going to have to become familiar with and how um, the Security and Compliance Center in Office 365 can meet those needs. Lots of planning, again, goes into this. Um, one new feature coming, it's in private preview now. I, I expect it to be announced um, publicly fairly soon, is the notion of unified labels. That's unifying the um, protection aspect with the retention. So both of those controls living in one label. Um, that's coming soon and will require lots of upfront planning work with the information management team and your IT um, administrators to get that configured in your environment. All right, uh, a big thing not to be forgotten about at the end of the migration is end user adoption. This will really help um, end users make a successful move from the shared network drive world into SharePoint. So uh, lots of ideas in this space if you look around. So it was hard to come up with just three because this is just, um, you know, some ideas, but there's lots of others. First is embed someone on the team for a while. The migration team I'm working on does this. So for the first week or two after a team has been migrated, someone who is an, a SharePoint adoption expert sits physically, if they can, with the team and is there to answer any questions that they may have. Um, end users are much more likely to ask questions if there's somebody close that they feel comfortable asking. Um, maybe they're you know, embarrassed to ask a question that they don't understand something. So this is a really good way of making that kind of a safe space to do that. Um, Microsoft's Ask Microsoft Anything sessions, you can have a, a version of that in your own organization called Ask Us Anything, where uh, you, know, you can have it for a particular point in time and end users can come to you and ask whatever they want. Um, just make sure you staff that appropriately with people from your desktop team likely and SharePoint um, and Exchange because you, you never really know the question they're gonna come at you with on there. Um, and build an adoption center. That's a great use case for a SharePoint communication site. On there, um, put you know, tips and tricks for working with SharePoint. Uh, point back to Microsoft support materials if you can. Uh, lots of great ideas on how to do that. Um, a really good use for a communication site. Here's the five top things I like to try to uh, explain to end users to make their transition a little bit easier. Metadata syncing, uh, I love the new OneDrive for Sync client. Uh, really a great way of having that offline access um, and end users like it because they're comfortable in what kind of looks like the old uh, file share world they used to live in. Searching, versioning, make sure they are, are aware that version history exists. You'd be amazed at how many users uh, don't, don't know that exists until uh, you know, there's a support ticket and they want to know what somebody did uh, three iterations ago and then you can show them how they can find that, as well as the recycle bin. Um, it's a self-serve model so they can restore 
files that they've deleted previously. So that's another great um, usability feature to show end users. So Joanne, you've been really key in championing the idea of the adoption center. That's that's uh, I love that idea of having an adoption center. Is that where you'd find like videos or training material around these these types of topics for you? Is that where your users would go? Yeah, yes. And you may have a formal training program in your organization, or you might have even purchased a third party product, but you can you want one place for end users to go to for help and adoption. And I would funnel all of those um, um, sections of, of SharePoint training um, on your adoption center. Now, I would eventually build an adoption center that's much more than SharePoint. You want to put all kinds of things in there, um, you know, planner, uh, OneDrive, OneNote, um, Yammer, all of those things could be in there. Yeah, and, and one Very thing cool. I didn't mention before is what I like to have on the front page of an adoption center is, is team success stories. Mm -hmm. It really feeds on itself. So if there's a good example of one of those business processes that you automated, um, advertise it and brag about it on the home page of your adoption center because yep. when other people and other teams go there, they're going to read that and it's going to plant a seed in their mind for maybe they could, you know, do something similar on their own team. And it kind of feeds on itself. I think that's a, a great place to put those kinds of stories. Yeah, yeah, that's that's excellent. That's that's actually a great segue to our last slide is is demonstrating the return on investment, right? You do want to do a little bit of tooting your own horn internally to show leadership that, you know, this this project that they they signed off on that they're actually seeing benefits of. So posting those success stories, that's a great idea for doing that. Um, you can collect stats as well, like some of the things that we've got listed here, like the amount of storage on the network file shares that's been reduced, the, the reduction in content that you're managing on the network file shares, uh, perhaps um, the number of staff that have moved to OneDrive or the number of teams that have moved to SharePoint. Those are also great things that you can report on to show return on investment or business benefit. Um, the number of solutions you put in place to increase productivity, and if there's ways to measure that productivity increase for each of those solutions, those are great things to capture also. Um, and then the, the percentage of content that you now have retention perhaps applied to where you didn't before. Um, so it's important to demonstrate the return on investment, either with success stories or with reports on you know, these types of statistics or um, however you can express that business benefit that the organization is gaining. Um, Joanne, is there anything you would add to this? Uh, no, I, I work a lot with retention. So that last point really uh, dr drives home for me and that that's a really big um, pro of being in SharePoint with uh, you can have global retention policies that every time you provision a new site, it's going to at a bare minimum have whatever your organization defines as that retention policy. So your um, compliance folks in your organization um, can, you know, sleep well knowing that maybe their content isn't going to be you know, inadvertently deleted if it's confidential, for instance. So that's that last bullet point is one that your um, security and compliance and risk departments in your organization will really be focused on. Great. Well, I wanted to thank everyone for their time. And Joanne, I wanted to thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate your insights on this. Um, yeah, you as well. Taylor, thank you so much, Antonio. Not a problem. Uh, Taylor, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we do, Antonio, and thanks to you both. Great presentation. Um, one of the questions that came in is, will this deck be sent out along with the presentation? The answer to that is early next week, everyone that attended this call will be receiving an email with the deck attached. And also in, the pres in this deck is a link to our YouTube channel where the recording will be. Um, and then the other last question that came through is, what kind of site do you provision for each team as you're migrating them? Okay, uh, I can, I yeah, can start with that one. Them? Okay. Um, that is uh, not an easy question to answer and is pretty organization specific. And I, I think it is a factor of your organization's um, approach 
to uh, the, the new collaboration tools that are offered in Office 365. When you're migrating shared network folders for Teams, typically you're going into the zone three and, three and four space that I had in my um, information architecture diagram. That's the collaboration spaces um, where you have Microsoft Teams, you have um, Outlook groups, you might have a Yammer group with it with that's been groupified. Oh yeah, all of those kinds of things live in there, and your organization may have a strategy for uh, maybe what kind of collaboration space you prefer, or maybe you want to have uh, uh, you want to ask each team how do you prefer to work? Do you want it to be chat based more than email based? Let's say. Um, yep. You need to ask all of those questions to know what kind of site it is provisioned. But one thing to be clear of is each and every one of those sites are, in fact, site collections, um, yep. not subsites. So that's really where we want to be in this space. And then we can apply the retention controls and in, in the uh, protection controls that we talked about at the end of the presentation. Um, and the information architecture is another thing that is scoped at a site collection level. So it really sets you up well uh, for everything that comes after it. But as far as the type of site, it's, it's really organization specific and nothing that can really be prescribed, I would say, from one organization to the next. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I, I would say that, you know, as you move into SharePoint Online as a collaboration space, it, it depends very much on the features within the site that you need to use, I find. So for example, you know, if, if you're able to do, um, if you're able to make use of a flat site architecture and just have site collections, personally, I think that that's the ideal in terms of site structure, subsites versus subsites, sorry, site collections versus subsites. There are some cases where subsites are still appealing, especially in cases where sites are getting created in an automated way. If you have a connection to some other system and you're going to end up with a lot of collaboration spaces in the thousands, that's where you know managing thousands of site collections can be challenging. Um, I also think it's ideal if you can make use of some of the structures that are already there, like a groupified site or a team, a Microsoft Teams team. I think those are ideal. Um, the modern sites as well, those are ideal as well. Sometimes there are certain features though that you need to make use of which aren't available in those yet, right? Things like, like document sets aren't available in modern team sites yet or um, audience targeting as well. So it, you know, if you can avoid those and use some of those built-in structures, I think that's ideal. But you know, if you do need to use some of those features and that might drive you to different types of, of sites or site structures. So as Joanne mentioned, I agree that it's very organization specific. It's not something that you can just prescribe the same for everyone. And luckily we have lots of tools to choose from. That's right. Great, one more question did come through the question window. Um, and it is, how have you addressed embedded links within files once they have been migrated? For example, Excel to Excel or Microsoft Project as well. Have you seen this before? Uh, I can quickly speak to that. Um, yes, I have seen that before. And the organization I'm working with now, they have purchased a tool to uh, fix those links after uh, post-migration. So you run the tool before you migrate to identify the links, you migrate the content, and then once it's done, you you run another iteration of the tool and it fixes those links. So it's, um, you know, at, certainly adds an extra step to the migration process. But if you have a lot of embedded links, uh, well worth it, because that's a really uh, bad experience for end users if you break all of their links. Yeah, I, I would agree. There's no built-in mechanism to deal with those en masse. You either have to look to a third-party tool to do it or create your own tool or your own uh, PowerShell scripts, if you will, um, to deal with that. Um, mm -hmm. But I would tend to recommend going with a third-party tool in this case, as, as Joanne mentioned. It's an extra step in the cleanup, essentially. Yeah. Okay, well, great. Well, that's a wrap for today. There's no more questions that came through. I uh, just want to say thank you all for attending today's webinar. And again, thank you both Antonio and Duran for a great presentation. You both did great. Um, hope everyone has a great rest of your Thursday, and we look forward to you joining our next webinar, June 14th, on an overview of the tools available in Office 365. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.